Um, I think I might hire Dina as a personal salesperson. <laughs> She's uh, quite amazing. Um, so um, my, uh, my exact title with Health 2.0 is Executive Director for International Activities. What we do is we do conferences, we do market intelligence, uh, but we also started doing a, a lot of pilot programs um, around the world. Um, and I've been doing that for a good number of years now, I think seven. Um, and I'm also involved with uh, a lot of European Commission uh, projects uh, that are here to support the digital health industry um, in Europe. So we're here to, today to uh, talk about accelerators. Uh, we all know what they're here for. Um, they're here to uh, help startups, uh, you know, get their kickoff, um, to solidify their business plan, uh, but also to, uh, to um, secure some investments uh, and, uh, and boost the uh, broad adoption of their solution. Now, a few years back, uh, Lisa Swenen from uh, Venture Valkyrie uh, in the U.S. Uh, identified and counted 164 dedicated accelerators, so dedicated to digital health. Um, that was about three years ago, and at the rate um, at which they are developing uh, around the world, and especially in Europe, I would bet anyone who's willing to do the count, not me, um, that there's way over 300 of them um, by now. So the question is really, how do you um, find the good ones? Um, how do you know if they're delivering on their promise or not? Um, and uh, as a startup, how should you um, pick yours? So we've gathered a few um, accelerator representatives here, and later on we'll see a, a, a few demos and we'll have a conversation with some of their alumni. Um, but I'd like to introduce you to uh, my panel. So I'll introduce the ladies first. So we have Eline Mignerus. Um, this is my annual mental workout, trying to figure out the pronunciation yeah. of <laughs> you Scandinavian guys. Um, so we have Eline, and then uh, she is from uh, Frog Leap in uh, Sweden. Mm -hmm. Then we have Julian Zilonska, Zilonka, uh, Zilonka sorry, um, mm -hmm. who's actually part of Health 2.0 in Berlin, but uh, also um, part of uh, or heading um, Startup Bootcamp in, uh, in uh, Germany. Uh, then we have Rune Teil, or Teil, Rune Teil, no, <laughs> <laughs> from Rockstart in, in the Netherlands, and we have Kenneth Salonius um, from uh, Vertical in Finland. So I'd like to start this discussion. We need to know what we're talking about here. So I'd like to uh, start this discussion by asking each one of you um, to introduce yourself and the program and uh, specifically tell us a few things about um, your accelerator, how many months, what kind of financial agreement um, is behind it, is there a cash equity deal, um, what kind of support you are providing, is it uh, just for a certain period of time or is there some prolongations at the end of the program, um, and finally, but might be the most difficult question to answer, but the most interesting too, what makes your accelerator better and different than the other programs? Um, should we start with Eline? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is uh, Eileen Mignerus. You were almost there, Pascal, with the <laughs> pronunciation. <laughs> uh, I, I work with Froglip Accelerator, which is based here in Stockholm. We've done uh, a six-month uh, acceleration program focusing on digital health. We brought in five companies uh, to participate in the program. And the first batch that we did was, um, was actually free for the startups to participate in, but with a plan to, to do it for equity later on. So what we uh, supported them with was uh, industry mentoring. We connected them with investors and also gave them dedicated hours with uh, with experts within all business fields trying to do due diligence to prepare them to pitch for investors. So that could be about HR or accounting or marketing or uh, pitch training as well. And I think what separated us when we started was 
especially location. We were the first in Stockholm, at least, even though we have our close neighbors in, in Helsinki as well. Um, I think that's a big differentiation because people maybe aren't uh, able to move somewhere else. Um, I think that's something that separates all of us uh, very distinctly to begin with. Um, and it's, um, it's been exciting to be a part of that community in Stockholm and see how that grows as well. Um, and trying to contribute to that and also connect with, uh, with other programs and investors in, in Europe and internationally as well. Julianne, shall we uh, continue with you? Yeah, happy to do so. So maybe some of you remember me from last year when I was on stage uh, presenting my Lara Companion software as a service startup, which I ran through a crowd investing campaign as an entrepreneur myself to, to understand the market is not ready, I did mistakes and I stopped it and took the offer from Startup Bootcamp to actually prevent startups from doing my mistakes as an entrepreneur. Now I have the opportunity with Startup Bootcamp, who is Europe's largest acceleration group, running 15 programs in 12 cities, to accelerate up to 30 startups in the next ten, uh, three years in digital health. And uh, we have the classic deal. We have three months acceleration program, free office space, connect you with mentors. But the thing is here, what separates us maybe from, from our, let's say, co-opetition partners <laughs> here, is that uh, my vertical, based in Berlin, is not only looking for global startups, but also for matching startups that match with our five industry partners that finance the whole startup bootcamp uh, in Europe. And the industry partners are Philips, Sanofi, Arvato, Apple Bank, and Munich Health. Names, it's an insurer, it's <laughs> top five pharma, it's one of the largest medtech companies, and the value that we create is um, the corporates could be your first five customers as a startup that comes into our acceleration. We take 6% equity for that and give you 15,000 euro cash. On the term 15, sheet, one yeah. five. on the term sheet, you really have to make sure, of course, that we get diluted as well, as well, but we position ourselves as your most valuable co-founder because it's really my mission to, to find the high potential teams to transform healthcare for better health outcomes. And we, all the MDs from all 15 programs worldwide, do the hell to really get you an additional funding. And the track records from Startup Bootcamp speak for themselves. We have six years of experience. Within the six years, Startup Bootcamp has accelerated 345 startups in total. We had nine exits so far. Um, we have 72% excuse me, uh, startups that get an additional funding after the nine months of acceleration, so they stay with us. They, of course, are shifted into the huge alumni network, and there comes the global family approach again. If you want to, let's say, start in, in Asia, we connect you to our Asian teams. And, uh, yeah, I'm totally passionate about health, and I think this is one of the biggest drivers to, to create this ecosystem of growth, which I didn't have when I was here last year on stage. Your passion always shows. <laughs> um, shall we continue with you, Kenneth? Yeah, so my name is Kenneth, Kenneth Salunius uh, from Vertical Accelerator in, in Helsinki. Um, we focus on a very broad scale of, of health, health startups, ranging from, from all the way from medical to nutrition and sports and uh, wellness. And um, a little bit like the bootcamp, we also work with industry partners, um, Samsung, Telia, Amer Sports, Fatser, which is uh, uh, famous for the blue chocolates. Um, and uh, really try to match them with the most promising startup companies. And uh, the program itself, so what we do is, is we focus on going from minimum viable product or prototype to minimum meaningful product, meaning that we help the companies very focused on, um, in a very focused manner on, on actually making the product uh, suitable uh, for the users, matching the needs of them and uh, making sure that it, it really fulfills their requirements. And um, in terms of investment, so we don't invest up front. Um, so we have decided to take a very different approach from, from many other accelerator programs in the sense that we instead we pull up that, that uh, small um, early stage investment into a, a bigger pool and then we invest in just a couple per program after the program has ended. And uh, that, we believe, will create a larger impact for the ones that we then decide to invest in and syndicate with, with others. So the approach there is, there is different. Um, we run now, uh, we are on our third program, so we were the first um, 
health-focused startup accelerator in the Nordics. And uh, we're now on the, on the third program. And uh, you will see some of our, some of our alumni, alumni and companies here, here today. All right, thank you. Rona, should we? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Is this working? Yeah. No? I think it, it is. It is working? I cannot yes. hear myself. So my name is uh, Rune Field. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of Rockstart. And I think the main thing that makes Rockstart different maybe for some other programs up here is we look at our company to support startups the first 1,000 days. So we do have a digital health program, but it doesn't, it doesn't just start there and it doesn't end there. Um, the program that we have is six months. Uh, but after the program, we really dedicate it to, to support the, the companies. So we look ourselves as the sort of third, first friendly early stage investor that any uh, startup would want to have, which means, of course, that after the program, we want to be there and, and support. We also work with a lot of industry partners, but actually our program uh, is primarily funded by uh, a VC from the Netherlands and local angel investors who've been in the digital health space themselves. So we really believe that there's a huge value in that in terms of getting follow-up funding for the companies. So the deal that we have is a, a 20K uh, against 8% equity. And um, yeah, what was the rest of the questions? <laughs> what type of support? What kind of support, of course. We have the, the standard sort of mentorship model where we have 60, 65 to 70 uh, mentors supporting the startups throughout the program. We have some, um, some quite significant partners like Wrapout, UMC, uh, Shape, Reshape, uh, and other industry partners, also like Philips. Um, and of course, we have the, uh, the space itself, so giving the entrepreneurs a space to be at for a one-year period. So what would you say makes the difference between Rockstart and other accelerators? Yeah, but it's, it, it's really the idea about um, looking at it either as a one-off program or looking at it as an early stage investor. Like taking a, a company through a very intensive period of three to six months is great, but that should also be the support afterwards. That's really what we found out and what we really believe in. So we're, uh, we're running programs in, in different areas, both energy in uh, digital health, but also in food tech, we are about to run in food tech. Um, and by doing that, we are allowing ourselves to have a bigger team. So we're actually a team of 30 people. So there's four people dedicated on the program, but there's also four people dedicated on alumni support. So you will, you will get the consistent uh, support from Rockstar moving forward. OK. So it might re sound like a TV reality show kind of exercise, but we've invited some of your alumni to uh, be part of the discussion. But before um, they um, hop on stage, I'd like to ask you, um, you three, first. Um, you were entrepreneurs before. Um, we still are. <laughs> yes, before don't, directing don't a, lose it. an accelerator. So what happened? Um, and uh, how are you taking the lessons learned as an entrepreneur and, and building in the program mm -hmm. um, to help people who were in your position before? Yeah, so I used to run two different companies before uh, starting Vertical together with my, my colleagues. Um, before starting Vertical, I also co-founded the largest health startup network in, in Finland. Uh, we've helped over 250 companies over the last five years to develop their operations and their connections. So the largest learning... Is that uh, Health Spa? Health Spa, yes. Okay. And uh, you will hear, hear about Health Spa also at the latest tomorrow. But um, the the... The most important thing I learned as an entrepreneur was that connections matters most. So if we can build through our um, accelerator program connections which are lasting and meaningful, uh, that will be the most valuable resource that uh, the entrepreneurs going through our program uh, can have. Uh, so that is why we also have a lot of focus on networking and, and meeting with the right people in our program. Okay, Julianne? Well, I have uh, two startups. The first one I built because I turned from patient to entrepreneur. I built a women's health portal focusing on fertility threatening diseases and raised 200k from the industry. The startup is still up and running. And the second one, which I presented yesterday, uh, last year, was a software as a service 
uh, for tackling mental health issues, actually for women and couples trying to conceive. And it took me three years to get it funded. And I did some mistakes, like uh, being too early in a too innovative market, not having the product ready, and also the team broke apart on the way to, to close actually the funding. I would have had the money end of year, um, but you see how I made the decision. And being an entrepreneur still, um, what I what I bring into the acceleration program and also what is helpful for the entrepreneurs that we choose is I can see, still see the sparkle in the eyes. You really have to have the stamina and the tenacity as an entrepreneur to really go through it. And I can tell from, from my experience which teams might be successful. And with the experience from my network and my own uh, fundraising experience, I have, let's say, a more trained muscle when it comes to business cases. Because for us with Startup Bootcamp, it's all about closing deals. And as Kenneth said, uh, you said connections, for us it's relations. Because the earlier you make the relations, the, the more you connect on a human being base, the, the stronger maybe it, it pulls you towards the business. Because in the end, you do business with, with people. Well, it's a profit maximization thing, but in the end, it's about people who work together. And this is how I also picked uh, the teams for this year's first cohort. We have 20 teams uh, going to be selected end of next week to have the final 10. And it's really, really um, interesting to see the diverse people on the one side but also giving them the opportunity to, to grow with the support of, of the network and the huge team I've built in Berlin. So you mentioned being early in the market as an error. I think it's more like a challenge. Um, you, don't, you don't choose to be early in the market. But um, how would you work with a company that really has a solution for which the market is not ready? Make sure you gain traction, either recurring revenue or customer growth. Make sure you gain the proof of concept to lower the risk that people, investors, invest in your case. Okay. And make sure you motivate your team all the time. Rune, from uh, entrepreneur to accelerator. Yeah, so I, I started my first uh, startup when I was 18. And uh, along with two other guys, actually two of my friends. And it, it was a terrible setup, like everything was bad. Um, we, we, we did get the product right. I don't think as a team we were very strong. Um, yeah, the traction we had was we looked at the wrong things. Like, I just think there was a lot of stuff wrong with it. So the thing, second thing I started, I went, um, started an e-commerce platform and grew that, like bootstrapped that. And quite early on I wanted to learn what it would take to make this a bigger, a bigger play. So I went to San Francisco, I spent some of the money that I made going to San Francisco, staying there for, for three months. And what I realized is the kind of network effect you find over in San Francisco is so different than what you have in Europe. For me to get a cup of coffee, to get some advice to somebody in Europe was almost impossible. I mean, the whole concept of just paying it forward was not existing back in 2010. So that was the first ignition for me to say, what the hell, this is the biggest problem we have. If we're going to have to be able to build companies like they could do it in the US, we need to be able to learn from each other. And the best way to do that, I think, is to start a, an accelerator. So that's actually what I, what I got involved with. Well, we've seen a lot of companies there. move from Europe to the US claiming that the uh, digital health industry was more dynamic um, over there, that people were uh, more open to collaboration, stuff like that. Uh, you think that accelerators might have a role in retaining our talent here? I definitely think we open up the networks. I think that's the primary function and the innovation of an accelerator, that we are the, the, the one that really, because of our model, cares about connecting all the partners, right? So whether it's angel investors, VCs, big corporates, you name it, that's the whole game. And before that, I don't think there was anyone really in, incentivized to do that because there was no for-profit uh, for model around it. Okay. In That's the true. end, it's all about speed and time to market. So the promise of Startup Bootcamp is we save you one year of development in just three months. Because sometimes NIP is not protectable or software is not protectable, so you have to be the fastest in the market with a high growth potential. And Startup Bootcamp has the, the power to give this exposure, which is a positive thing when you really make it, and a negative thing if you screw it up, because you're visible. 
boot camp? Do you wake them it's up negative, at 5 a.m. to do some running, some push-ups, and then work on their business plan? That's a great idea, Pascal. I should really do that. But we think more of yoga classes and mindfulness trainings during the program. However, it's a just regular schedule, having a Monday to Friday, lots of workshops, one-to-one -one lessons, also one day off to work on your product and service. But I might jump into that idea. <laughs> Kenneth, you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, no, actually, we've been doing the exercise. It's really great. You should also start doing that. But looking at the connections and uh, now comparing to, for example, California and the other hubs, then in the Nordics, we truly have now a unique opportunity to establish this region as the digital health hub. And uh, I think that the accelerator programs here have a really important role in building that brand uh, for, for the region. And um, there's not currently in the world, there's not a definite digital health hub. So you don't go to, to any particular city for that. And uh, that's what we're, we're working on also here. Also, there's a certain readiness of uh, Scandinavian startups in a positive way compared to different cultures in Europe, what, what I have experienced from traveling around all the, all the world. I'm not sure if you can share this, but there, there are the Scandinavian in, in my... Um, perception from the market readiness are a little bit more advanced than, than non-Scandinavians, put it this way. All right, well, maybe, maybe just to add to that, like, am I not to? Um, I, I agree. I think uh, accelerators also in the Nordic really plays an important role to put, uh, like, you have the ecosystem coming together. But as a startup, I would really look at what you, what you need, right? Because there's a reason to go to Berlin, maybe. There might be a reason to go here to Stockholm, there might be a reason to go to San Francisco or to, uh, to the Netherlands. And I think you should look at the network of what accelerator you might be looking at. Good point. Plus, also make sure you can have a cost of living. What we give you is 15,000 euros. In London, you would survive one month. In Berlin, it's stretchable. So yeah. <laughs> it's possible. That's something that I tell startups from time to time when they say, oh, we just opened an office. We got investment and we opened an office in San Francisco. And I'm like, Great, you're going to burn all your money in rent. Yep. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. Um, Eileen, while John is preparing for um, his uh, little pitch, um, first you wanted to comment on the, on the retaining of the talent and the yeah, role of I the accelerators. Yeah, I just wanted to continue on the role of the accelerators, uh, especially since a lot of companies that we see applying for accelerators are really early stage. Um, the, the role that accelerators can have is really bridging between the startup com community and investors or industry, and that's a really important role to facilitate for, for those startups, and especially gathering them together to, to bring traction to whatev whatever hub geographically as well. So we're going to start with one of your um, startup, yes. um, and I will introduce him uh, in a second. But you're actually not recruiting. You're in a non-active phase of the accelerator program exactly, right yeah. now. Um, so, can you share some lessons learned? Um, what would you say was good, bad, ugly? What uh, would you change? I, what would you To, to start with the good, I think we, we managed to have a, a good program that actually brought value to, to the startups. We'll see if John agrees later on. We'll ask him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but as for the bad, it's, it's with any startup, really, that you have to plan ahead to, to know how to continue. So for us, it was not that, that far stretched in the planning as it should have been to know how to continue after the first, first batch. Um, I think that's really a lesson learned for, for anyone who's in a startup to, um, yeah, to, to continue ahead all the time. Um, so, so yeah, we were a part of an EU program and I know that we're, our accelerators are funded differently as well. So, mm. um, not to talk bad about the EU, but I would probably go with, with private funding uh, if I would do it again, all over. I'm not going to comment on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're going to uh, have John Siolung um, uh, tell us a little bit about his company, Time Insulin, and then you'll join us um, in the discussion with uh, our accelerators. Great, thank you. And it's, uh, it's nice to be here. So we were part of the Frog Leap program, and our position was maybe a little different because we had an existing product when we joined it. Uh, see, I'm a patient entrepreneur. I have type 1 diabetes, and we, we made this product called Time Insulin. 
um, which is a replacement cap for insulin pens that helps ensure that you don't take a double dose of insulin. Since joining the program, uh, we've launched into the US. We have a couple hundred thousand us people using our product and are very proud that uh, as a patient, we are able to solve a problem that affects 93% of all insulin users, but wasn't, uh, wasn't taken care of by industry. But what I'm, what I'm really proud to show, what I wasn't able to show last year, if they're able to put up the, the, the browser from that computer, is my pancreas. See, I've made an artificial pancreas here, and I'm one of about 80 people in the world that's using this. And this has revolutionized my life in living with diabetes. What this does is it takes the data that those of us who are living with diabetes are generating all the time, and it puts it into a computer, runs a control al algorithm, and automatically handles my diabetes. It goes onto autopilot. Uh, and it's, it's a shame if you, can't, if you can get the browser up, because this is really powerful. Waking up with a perfect blood sugar every morning is incredible. Or you'll see it towards the, your right side, I had a cup of coffee earlier and my blood sugar started to go up a little bit from that. But on that blue line going up, you'll see that this system automatically gave me more insulin and it got right back in line. What we have been seeing in, in diabetes is that all of the investment in this area, which is pretty close to the cure for diabetes because it takes away the burden of living with it, is going into insulin pumps. And insulin pumps are used by about 5% of the population. So what we have developed and are, we believe are the only ones in the world, is the next version of this cap that is able to, in a highly accurate way and a low-cost way, get the data off of these insulin pens and get it into these systems so that you get personalized recommendations as to what you should do with your diabetes. And for those of you who may know a little bit about diabetes or know someone who's living with it, this is truly the future of diabetes. In two years, this is what it's going to look like. And so my experience being able to build one of these for myself has been profound. So we're, we're really proud, you know, Digital Health Day. Well, this is my digital health. I've now taken control of it, and it's changed my life. Good job. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> now we're going to have um, Jana Maya Coivisto uh, from Practigain. Tell us a little bit about your solution. Yes. Hello, nice to be here. Uh, our product is totally different. We make games for nurses and doctors. Classroom teaching is ineffective and expensive. And we are doing something to change that. Our goal is to bring efficient, engaging and cost-effective learning for healthcare professionals. We combine gaming elements with virtual simulations. And our first product, Care Me Game, consists of patient scenarios in an immersive environment. And now if we have the video, I would like to show you our product because it tells a lot more than I can do. So we have a patient in a hospital room and first, when the player starts, he or she reads the patient background. Then he can ask questions about the, from the patient. So the player gets information, how is the patient doing? And then you can always go back to the background information. After you have... Uh, interview the patient, you can assess the patient's clinical status. And we are trying to get people really to want to help this patient. And that's why we have a 3D artist who is bringing the patient alive. In the right up corner, you can see a nurse. Uh, she's giving uh, reasoning and that kind of information that you can for example, if the patient has cold arms, you can't assess that because you can touch him, at least yet. Um, we have tested this game uh, for several hundreds of nursing students and also nurses in intensive care units. Now we are uh, starting to do 
uh, version for doctors. We are going to add, for example, some um, diagnostic parts for the, this game. So, my background is in healthcare education, and my co-founders are game designers. And if you want to get immersed in patient care, please come to talk to me. Thank you. Thank you, Jana Meyer. Please have a seat. Um, while we wake up, uh, we uh, welcome our, uh, our last uh, uh, live demo, then we'll have one on, on Skype. Yeah, Skype, is that it? It's um, on phone, but I will do the clicking. It's technology. Um, let's welcome Pitu Cabanillas, <laughs> um, originally from Argentina, but part of the uh, Rockstar program presenting Fueling. Yeah, hello, can you hear me fine? Hello, I'm Pitu, I'm the founder of Fueling. I'm from Argentina, but I'm happy to be here. And thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, a little bit about me, I have eight years of experience in human resources, implementing wellness program, and there are two fields that I feel comfortable talking about. Lionel Messi, of course, from Argentina, and wellness program. Um, I love sports, I love running, and when I see people living in a healthy lifestyle, I ask myself, when will the day companies realize that one of the best competitive advantages is having healthy and active employees? Fortunately, innovative workplace understand the values of investing in wellness program. Uh, Netherlands is in a kind of country that invests a lot of budget to promote physical activity between employees. This is the reason because choose the Netherlands. Fueling is an app for companies that encourage and reward employees for their sportsmanship. We ran an experiment that showed that active employees tend to be more productive, more engaged, and more happy. And this is what we do. We got the data generated by Fitness Tracker because a lot of people are using Fitness Tracker. We bring innovation wellness program. We allow employees get reward for exercising and we create a community around sport, sportsmanship. So then we have time to talk about more with detail in fueling, but uh, this is what we do. And thank you very much for, for having me. Thank you, Pitu. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Roberta Muzaro. Yeah, I'm just calling phone. her. Once. So this sounds promising. She's in Barcelona. She's in Barcelona, and she's in... She's an SBC Startup Bootcamp alumni, and she has been with me this morning, so we had... Hello. Hi, Roberta. You are on stage now. Ah, okay. okay. Hello, everyone. I will be your virtual clicker once the presentation is on. So can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. And the clicker is working. Okay. So please start. Okay, tell me when I can start, because I have some problem with the sound. Sorry, what did you say, Roberta? What did you say? We can hear you. Problem with that. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a good morning. To join the conference. So I'd like to tell you something more about me and my business. So I'm Roberta, I'm Italian, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Menio. I attended the program of Startup Bootcamp in Barcelona, and it was an amazing experience. So let's see something more about Menio. Next. Done. So this is my father, and two years ago, he had a stroke because he forgot to take his medication. But if you believe that it is a unique situation, you are wrong. Next. Done. Because during the last year, more than 20 million people were hospitalized for the same problem. Next. Done. For this reason, we have created Memiocall. 
It's a safe and simple solution that will improve adherence to medical therapies. But let's see how it works. Next. Done. So, when the doctor makes the prescription, next. Yes. The user or the caregiver can book the service through our platform or in one of our pharmacies. Next. Done. He can choose the service of SMS or vocal messages that are completely customizable and it pays a monthly fee. Next. Done. So when it's time to take the medication, we send an alert on the fixed or mobile telephone of the user. Next. Done. So the user takes the right medication at the right time. Next. Done. The market that we are addressing is the mobile health. Now it worth more than 13 billion euros with an annual growth rate of the 30%. Next. Done. The non-adherence is a real huge problem. You have to consider that during the last year had an impact on the healthcare European system of more than 125 billion euros. Next. Done. Our users are people over 60 years old who suffer from multiple chronic diseases. All over the world, they are more than 108 million. And only in Italy, our first markets are more than 4 million. Next. Done. We are addressing our target thanks to strategic B2B channels that share our same customer base, such as health insurance company, private clinics or hospitals, or companies that work with chronically ill patients. Okay, can you speed up a little bit, please? Yes. Okay, next. Okay, we have the B2B channels, and we have the partnerships, and we have the big data, and what we've yeah. done so far is that you are, have raised some seed funding and you're starting yeah. a program with Unicredit Lab in September and yeah. that you are very busy in communication and <laughs> social media. <laughs> and the final yeah. slide, I guess, is the team, right? Yes. The uh, key of our success is the team. Thank you, Roberta. Um, I, I, we're going to uh, you know, applaud you. I hope you can hear it from where you are. Thank you. That was a great example of like startup accelerator teamwork action. Uh, so thank you for time. that. <laughs> thank um, you so much, Roberta. They will click thank your you. slides Bye. for you <laughs> and finish your presentation if need be. Um, I don't know if Roberta can stay on the line um, with us, but I wanted to have a a little discussion with um, you guys, and if Roberta can also comment um, via phone. Um, what was the main reason uh, for you to join one of these um, programs? Um, what would you say were the main um, outcomes or the main achievements? Uh, did you secure investment? Did you have a large-scale implementation or something like that? Um, and finally, um, what would you say was the, the main positive aspect of the program and what would you slightly change? Um, uh, and let's not be too political here, even if your guys are here, um, let's try to be uh, open. Um, shall we start with you, P2? I think, uh, I think it's, um, we choose the Netherlands for three reasons. The first reason is because it's in a country so active or, or market is looking for companies that are innovating wellness programs. So uh, the Netherlands is in a kind of country that, we, that fully can fit. And then about the accelerator, um, I think it's about the ecosystems, you know, uh, 
in the Netherlands or in, in Nijmegen, we can found a kind of stakeholder living together and patient that Lucien say to, in the morning, available to share the data, uh, hospitals, uh, investors, mentors. But I think the big challenge for Accelerator is recruit uh, solid teams uh, with, with good experience because at the end of the day, you will say you will work in whole day with people from different cultures, from different languages. We were from Tunis, from Canada, from Mexico, from Argentina, Spain, the Netherlands. And I think it's positive to uh, share this experience. And for me, the challenge for Accelerator is recruit uh, good teams more than good startups. And this is my point of view. So did, did, do you mean that you chose the location before choosing the Accelerator? Yeah, yeah. You chose the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah the ecosystem. And then this is an, a personal experience. Um, I live in, in Valencia, in Brussels, in Paris, in Buenos Aires, in Barcelona. And I'm, I'm really, really like connect with people and the Netherlands is in a kind of country that I, I, could, I can connect with this, with this culture and I'm happy to, to work there. Diana Maya. Thank you. Uh, actually, we have just started a few years, weeks ago and um, I think that the main reason why we wanted to apply for the what vertical uh, is that um, our background is in uh, university and we started with a project and uh, we had a good we have a good team to make the product but we don't have and didn't have the knowledge to how to make business with it and we wanted to have um, con connections and help with business models and branding and all that that thing and and for me personally, because my background is in, I'm a nurse, a nurse educator, and now um, I'm in this whole new world. So I think this is a opportunity for me to grow uh, and, and learn a lot more and new things. So this is my experience so far. But how did you pick your accelerator? Um, when, when I worked at the university, I knew Vertical before because we had okay. had a lot of talks. And when we um, started a company, then um, I think that they were interested about us and we were interested about them. And so we kind of... Hmm. Did, John, did you find yourself facing a, a certain num number of possibilities and you, you picked... Um, no, not, you know, the Frog Leap program was a little bit different than what I've heard from the others in that, that, you know, they don't make an investment and they don't take equity in it. So for us, it was a no-brainer. You know, what was really attractive for us was the access to really smart and capable people in the network that we got. And we got that at no cost. So for us, it was really a no-brainer. We weren't actively looking for an accelerator, uh, but, you know, we happened to come across it. We were recommended to apply, and it was really, really wonderful for us. And I think, you know, the, to the, the third question you asked, the challenge that I've seen, uh, I come from software originally, and when you make software, you, you can test, learn, and refine software, and, and, and digital health companies and programs at a much lower cost than hardware. And this was the first hardware product I've ever made, and it was a rude awakening at how difficult and how expensive hardware is. And, you know, now as we're as we're looking at this product, and you know, I can truly tell you that this is, this is gonna be a revolution in diabetes that I have in my hand right here, but the costs of getting it to market are enormous. And if, if you're not you know, bought by one of the big pharma companies, then you have some pretty serious challenges as to how to commercialize it. So I think that's a learning for, all of, for the accelerators as to how to work with hardware companies well, because the, the costs are just very different. Mm. What would you say are the thing that, that could be slightly tweaked uh, in the programs that you were in um, that would have made your experience, or um, in your case, Maya, still would be uh, valuable today? Yeah, I think, you know, the Frogly program was new. I, I think, you know, any, our, our problem as a company is that people don't know our product exists. So anything that can help on that helps a lot. And what I was going to say is, you know, maybe, maybe making it more international. So it was quite focused on Stockholm and Sweden. Mm. You know, maybe you go on a road trip to, to, you know, whether it's Boston where a lot happens in diabetes or San Diego or those kinds of things. That'd probably be my, my biggest comment. 
Okay. Um, Yanamaya and then uh, Pitu, and then we'll close the session. That will be the uh, the final word. Is that okay with you, Dina? Absolutely. I see you coming closer and closer. It's just a topic <laughs> that I'm really passionate about myself. So I would like to actually encourage everyone to continue this conversation as well online after we wrap up, because I know that so much, so many questions to discuss and ask on both sides. So okay. let's keep up this conversation as well after we finish. Okay, so okay. let's uh, give a, a big round of applause to all our panelists mm -hmm. here. <laughs> Thanks for uh, joining us, and as we all leave the stage, um, I'd like to uh, introduce um, Ilva Ulva, I think probably, Hultmann, um, from Invest uh, Stockholm. So. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll give you a, a big round of applause uh, also. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Um, I will start by thanking the, the earlier speaker. They have really been inspiring. I think it's been a very, very interesting morning. So, um, my name is Ilva Hultman. I work for Invest.com. I'm here today with my colleague, Ose Andersson. So what we do that we're trying to attract investments to the region in terms of establishment, industrial collaboration, and also trying to attract capital to the companies. Um, so um, we are owned by the city, and we collaborate with 54 uh, cities around Stockholm. And actually 51% of the life science companies Uh, have their home in this region. So, um, Stockholm Uppsala is one of the strongest clusters in Europe, and here are some figures behind it. We have uh, 650 companies, we have five unicorns, we have uh, 17 Nobel Prize laureates, and we have four top universities. And um, um, Digital health uh, didn't happen yesterday. It's been around since 1958, where the pacemaker was invented. So some reasons of, um, why this sector is really strong in life science. So we have these renowned healthcare institutions, uh, Karolinska Institute at Uppsala University, um, and the Royal Institute of Technology. And we have some leading um, mobile communication companies uh, in Shista, for example. And we have some strong presence of globally leading pharmaceutical companies. And like 25 years ago, we have this, uh, or 20, year, 20, 25 years ago, we had this IT boom in Stockholm. And today, these people work in tech, in um, uh, music tech, in fintech, financial tech. Uh, in food tech, in textile tech, and uh, um, many of uh, those persons have created their own businesses in um, uh, digital health. And uh, they have um, a global vision today, and they are um, getting more and more internationalized. So how do we work with investors? Um, it's hard to communicate Uh, in a very short time what we have when we meet investors. And um, based on this, we have created the Stockholm Uppsala Life Science Investment Hot List. It's a list that consists of today 43 companies. So uh, here are some of the guidelines who are on this list and who can be on this list. But we want to be including, so uh, please contact us for information about this. So um, uh, today we have, as I said, 43 companies. The segment uh, digital health uh, is getting bigger and bigger. So today we have many of the companies here, for example, Biosync. Uh, we have um, Mediterner, and we have uh, MedUniverse, we have MindApps, and we have uh, TimeSolin that you just listened to. We are really proud of those companies. And um, it works like this. Um, each company has four slides uh, communicating the challenge and how they found the solution. Um, Gnosco is a company that have a product called um, Dermicus, and it's an easy to use, flexible, and secure decision support system for skin cancer and wounds. 
this is a very interesting company as well. So uh, each company has uh, four slides um, telling about the business model, the challenges, and the market, the progress, and um, uh, some financial information. This is a very young company, uh, so it's not in there yet, but it will be. And um, uh, also what each company is looking for. So to the investors, we send this hot list. It's not for everyone. They have to, um, because it's, it's sometimes it's a bit, uh, it's not for everyone. And um, uh, we have a summary. Um, and we think this is a very efficient uh, and easy way of communicating to the investors. And that is the feedback that we are uh, getting. And today we are in a discussion with about 15 pharma companies. So how is it going for the, um, for the companies in Stockholm? Well, we are a bit, uh, were a bit nervous when we got the figures uh, because last year was a very, very good year in terms of, number of um, the amount that was invested, if you look at uh, 2015. And this year, 2016, already by midsummer, we had passed that figure. So we are really... Uh, glad for this, and according to this survey, there were no investments in digital health 2015, and already now we have more than 11 investments, and that figure also came out by, by midsummer. So we are very optimistic about investments to Stockholm. Thank you very much, and please get in contact with me if we can help you. Thank you. Uber. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I just wanted to make a short announcement. This is from Christian Gutmann from healthyhabits.com, who is looking for beta users with diabetes type 2 or prediabetes mm -hmm. for an exciting app test. Please go to H2 booth or send an email to infohealthyhabits.com um, for more information. Thank okay. you. Thank you.